Good morning. Good morning. It is indeed a good morning uh, to be with everyone and to see everybody. Remember to keep those in prayers uh, who are not well this morning would love to be here, uh, but for whatever reason is not able to be. Uh, as we look at today's lesson, today's lesson uh, actually results from a question. Somebody wanted me to talk more about this particular verse, and so I said, that'd be a great idea. And so if you have, if you have your reading about things like this, might would make a, a good sermon talk. If I want to know more about this, just give me a note. Now let me know, and I can, I can help. Uh, hopefully I can help I do those things this morning. I know a girl. Now literally, she's 18 years old. I know a girl who cannot tell her right hand from her left hand. She's not joking, and I'm not making this up. This is not just a, a preacher in preaching illustration. She really doesn't know. In fact, whenever she drives, when her, her mother was telling her, you need to take a left turn, she literally would do this on the steering wheel. And she didn't care to tell you that that's what she would do to find out which way she's to turn. Because you know how that works, right? This is left. That's how you ride it. And so she literally would do that because she does not know has no idea. And when we look in the book of Jonah, in the book of Jonah, Jonah is upset. Why is Jonah upset? Well, first of all, when you look through Jonah, Jonah is told to go to Nineveh to preach to that great city that they may repent and turn from their wicked ways and follow the most holy God. Jonah doesn't want to do that. Why? Well, the Assyrians are Israel's sworn enemies. He's telling the enemy to repent or to change or they're going to perish in 40 days. Well, after being thrown in that ocean, being saved by the well, Jonah felt that was the right thing to do. So he goes to out the city and tells people, 40 days you shall perish. So he goes back on his high mountain and he looks over the city waiting for this destruction. Now as he's waiting for this, the Ninevites from the smallest to the greatest repent. From the king down to sackcloth and ashes, God spares the city. Jonah is upset. God spared the enemies. At the main, the main last verse, John 4 and verse 11. Should I not? He did the Ninevites. There are 120,000 who don't know their right hand from their left and many livestock. There are many people who just don't know where they're going. Should not have pity upon them. See, when we start looking at the, this idea, the right and left, and that's that's when and that's the verse two. That's the one that we're real concerned about. What we're talking about is a manner of life and how we live. And there's some people who don't understand how we're supposed to live, and there are those. Who even though they understand the life they're supposed to live, chooses not to live that life. And so when we look at these verses, I'm going to do two things for us this morning. I want to weigh the balance of wisdom and folly. And then I'm going to talk about some dead flies. And the dead flies occur because we know how to live life. We have this wisdom. And yet there's something that... Blemishes our wisdom. That's what walking, walking, falling. So let's go ahead and get some ideas out about wisdom first. When we look at wisdom, I want us to look a few verses up in, in Ecclesiastes in chapter nine. In Ecclesiastes chapter nine, starting in verse thirteen, what Solomon has done is he outlines a use of wisdom. Now, when we go back to the book, I used to think the book was saying, hey, under the sun, let's try to find all this happiness and all this, all this joy, and this is my great big experiment, and I failed. But as I read through the book, what he's really doing, what the preacher is doing, or Solomon is doing, is he's outlining, these are things I tried, don't do this. Because it's just vanity. This is how I live my life, and this is how I observe people doing things. You don't do that because the end result is vanity. It's a grasping for the wind. And those who grasp for the wind are not going to catch it. So notice the illustration he gives in Ecclesiastes 9 and 13. This wisdom I have also seen under the sun, and it seemed great to me. Now, 
again, when you read Ecclesiastes, under the sun is anything on the earth that you live on. This is not heavenly wisdom. And it's important to see that. This is just things under the sun, things that we can know outside of, you know, um, outside of God's word and outside of asking what God thinks about things. So on this earthly speaking, in this in, in, you know, just in a carnal sense, it seemed great to me. There, there was a little city with a few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it and built great snares around it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that same poor man. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Words of wisdom spoken quietly should be heard, rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Now, just to give the illustration, just to, to build this up, there are ideas of cities, and we think of cities like Greenville's a city, it's a, it's a big area. But the idea of a city in this time, it could have been a small camp and they had a wall. And the only way in and out of this wall is generally by one gate. And so what an opposing army would do is cut off the supply. If we can't get food into the city, what are people going to do? They're going to starve. Or they're going to give up. If we cut off the water supply, what are they going to do? They're going to thirst. Or they're going to give up. Then that the session is a lot, but we don't get those in and out of the city, they're just going to give up. And so what the wise, what did the king do? Let's build us some up and keep people from going in and out of the city. They can't get the supplies, we're going to win. But there was one poor wise man who nobody remembers was able to save the city. So what was his conclusion? Conclusion was this. Wisdom is better than strength. Knowing how to do something is better than just being strong. Now, I will tell you, I break everything. That's no joke. I have broke axe handles. I have broke matic handles. I have broke all, you're talking about two, three inch round handles. I have broke them. And I, I talked to this gentleman. He said, Ralph, if you just learned how to use that tool, you wouldn't break so much stuff. And I said, it's three inches round. You're not using it right. I need help because I'm breaking it. And the idea is, he can teach me how not to do that. But I would have to listen and give heed to what he had to say. I would have to do the things that that is wisdom. Doing the things we know to do. It's better than strength. It's quietly spoken. I have often come to realize the person who knows the most in the room isn't necessarily the one speaking. What does that mean? With wisdom, wisdom understands that if you give knowledge to people who don't care, they're not going to listen. And this is how Jesus illustrates it. Don't throw your pearls before swine. Or give what is holy to dogs. Why would you not do that? The pigs don't care about pearls. They only want food. Dogs don't care about what is holy. They just want food. They don't care. So in essence, in Matthew 7, when Jesus is talking about that, make a judgment call. If somebody is going to respect what you say, you say it. If they're not, don't say it. Until they're ready to hear. Wisdom is softly spoken. But Solomon says, the preacher said, you need to listen to that stuff. You need to really listen to it. Wisdom is better than the weapons of war. Now think about that for a second. How in the world, in Ecclesiastes 9, 18, how in the world is, is wisdom better than the weapons of war? If you can get out of it without getting a fight, that's a really good deal. It's a really good deal. If you know how to handle situations, if you know how to talk with people, you can cover mountains of material. You can overcome all kinds of obstacles. And I'll share one to you. 
not hurt one finger. We go back and think about this, wisdom is really good. But then we have folly, and folly is a result of fools. Fools live in folly. Fools are those who do not take instruction. Fools are those who don't do what they know they're supposed to do. This in, in wisdom literature, whether we're looking at the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the fool is the one who doesn't respect what God has to say about things. So let's go back and look at this again. Some things about the callings. Fools, they shout. Their ways are clearly heard. They're saying stuff. And they're saying stuff, and we sit back and we say, how in the world does that make any sense? And they're generally the first person to say things. How does that even work? Why would we do it that way? That's folly. Notice we look at the scripture reading 10 3. Even when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom, and he shows everyone that he is a fool. Even though he's doing the things he's supposed to do, he's showing everybody he doesn't know what he's doing. He's showing everybody he's not liking, he's liking wisdom. He, he doesn't have it figured out. It's clearly seen that he doesn't understand. And notice again at the end of verse 18, one sin destroys much good. There's a lot of good things going on. But then you have the one individual that goes and they throw this monkey wrench in it. And as they throw that monkey wrench in it, all the good that was being done all of a sudden stops. If I want to use a proverb from today, it would be the squeaky wheel gets the old. And you and I both have been in situations, the squeaky wheel sometimes doesn't know what they're talking about. But they're the ones stirring things up. And so they're the ones that get petty. And so when we look at this idea between wisdom and folly, we come to this idea of a manner of living. Does he have this right hand? A wise man lives by his right hand, but a fool by his the fools are by his left. So we look at what does this mean for the most part? When we look at these ideas in wisdom literature, the right hand generally is the stronger, the more dominant, the place of honor. That generally is the case. I understand everyone's not left handed. So in your mind, you've got to flip that around. Because there are people that are probably stronger with their left hand than they have my right hand. There are, I know there are people who could do things better with their left than their right. I understand that. Literature, God's literature understands that. But we sit down and we say, generally, the right hand is a place of honor, a place of authority, a place of dexterity. You can do it well, your right hand. The left hand is inferior, insecure, and clumsy. See, in my house, there are five of us. I have, I have three brothers and I have a sister. And we're a mix. We're, we're, we are. We really are. And so if, I ask, if you ask me, how, you know, what is the, the handwriting like in our house? I have two right-handed brothers. I have a sister and a brother that's left-handed. And I can do it with both hands. My left hand is not near as good. And I can write with both hands at the same time. And it's still not near as good. But we sit down and think about it. If we know that a way is right, pure, and secure in living our lives, which one should we choose if we're going to be wise? We're going to choose that way. If God has outlined a way for us to live, then that's the way we ought to live. Because God is the creator, we're the creation, and who else knows better than the way to live life than the creator? But there are some that desire to live life another way, a different way. So this isn't necessarily about right and left. It has to do with there's a way that leads to promise 
Are we walking that way? There's a way that leads to destruction. Are we walking that way even though we know how to get to life? That's the question. So that's what these verses are talking about. But Ralph, you said you're going to talk about some dead flies. Let's talk about some dead flies. See, when you start thinking about perfume, what we do is we go to the store and we just buy it. Or we go online and we just buy it. In general, we're not making this stuff. This is not something we're sitting down and making. But at the time this was written, it took months to make this oil. It took months to make this perfume, this ointment that was needed. It took months. It took a, a long time to do this. And sometimes flies were in there. Now it could be that the flies die while they're in there. It could be the flies that cause a disease. When we look, I have a footnote in my Bible that says flies of death, which means they, they carry a disease with them. When we start thinking about the life we live as Christians, if we're walking in God's ways, there are dead flies that sometimes litter our lives. I'll give some for instances. If we turn our Bibles over to 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, we come across Paul's discussion. And as Paul is writing here, he's writing to a people who seem to be educated. In fact, when you go to 1 Corinthians in chapter, in chapter 5, they're puffed up. They, they're up here. They, they know stuff. Well, they're educated people, and that's okay. I love educated people, and I love uneducated people. Sometimes it gets in the way of following after Jesus. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, starting in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness. To those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. There are some people who believe that the word of this book is foolishness. That we shouldn't live it, that we shouldn't give our lives to it, that we shouldn't give one ounce of energy trying to understand it. There are people who believe that. Those people are wrong. Those people are wrong. And Paul goes through this and points this out. Notice in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to, the, to save those who believe. Now, I mean, look at this. He said, now there's some that are well up here. They're, they're thinking of themselves or way up here. So God chose a message that they're not going to believe to save us. Notice again in verse 26. But for you see your calling, brethren, that many, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many no more called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame to the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame the might, to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing those which are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But to him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and the righteousness and sanctification and the redemption. So when we start looking at it this way, there are ways this book talks about that people would call ancient and outdated that we don't need to listen to. Well, if we're Christians and we follow God, the wise thing to do is walk in these ways. And there are those who have made excuses saying that, well, I can do God this way. My way is better than God's. In other words, they'll put it this way. God will understand. God knows my heart about the matter. Who are you to tell me what the book says? In reality, they're saying, I'm smarter than you, God, and I'm going to do it my way. As followers of Christ, that is a dead fly. Dead fly. Worry. Worry is a dead fly. You realize worry is the most useless thing that an individual can do. We can sit down and make many, many, many plans. And we can fret 
and try to figure all these things out. And in reality, we cannot control one thing. There's nothing we can control. Except for our actions towards something. There was a time. I mean, I've never told this in the story. There was a time when I was in pre hardened lectures. And during this pre hardened lectureship, there were tornadoes. Yes, they were everywhere. No, Kenny wasn't with me, so she tried to call me. She didn't get out of me. So she called one of her friends and sent her friends to find me. Where is he? My friend Tom roomed with him. He said, Ralph, I think somebody's hollering in my following for you. Okay. Oh, those tornado signs? Yeah. Okay. Call her up. What were you doing? I was sleeping. Why? I can't stop the tornado. Now, I probably shouldn't have been in the top of a, of a building sleeping, or, but there's really, I can't stop that. I can't control it. When we go to Matthew 6 25, notice what Jesus says. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? In verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God is righteousness. All those things will be added to you. If we don't have enough food, we find a way to get it. If we don't have enough clothing, we find a way to get it. But to sit and worry and say, God ain't going to take care of me? And we're God's followers? How does that work? We may not get to eat exactly what we want to eat. We may not, we may not wear exactly what we want to wear. We may not be able to do exactly what we want. But Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. And God took care of him. So it's important for us to see that's a dead fly. That's a dead fly. Prejudice. Is a dead fly. Turn our Bibles over to James in chapter 2. Notice how James puts this. James in chapter 2, my brethren, do not hold, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, of partiality. For there should come into your assembly a man with fine with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you Pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place or, and say to the poor man, you stand, stand there or sit here by my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Now the partiality he's talking about in this instance of the haves and have nots. If we treat somebody good it's because they have something, that's sinful. If we treat somebody poorly because they don't have something, that's sinful. That would even go down to race. That would go down to where we're from. You realize there are people, if I tell them that I grew up in the mountains of East Kentucky, would have nothing good to say about me because that's where I was raised. I had no dealing in that. That's just prejudice. That's all it is. And all that's sinful. Everything. And even when we get down to the idea of race, it's ridiculous to think that Jesus would be the only white man down out in the Middle East. He wasn't. He wasn't even a white man. And so we sit down and we think about these things. Those places have no place in our lives. Nowhere. That is a dead fly. A dead fly in our lives. Being ritualistic is a dead fly. Just doing things for the sake of doing things is a dead fly in our lives. If we, and if we're not careful, we do this. We get into such a ritual, we forget that even coming to church has a meaning. Listening to the word preached has a meaning. Reading God's word has a meaning. Showing love to others has a meaning. Sometimes we get so ritualistic, we forget the meaning behind these things. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus repeatedly over and over and over talks to the scribes and the Pharisees and he calls them hypocrites. First of all, 
The Pharisees were the religious teachers of the law. They would have known what God wanted, but they wasn't doing it. The scribes were writing these things down, and they were taking they were teaching others and showing them these rabbis, these teachers were teaching, but they wasn't doing it. And notice how much they went into how they did things. In Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and ants and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And in Luke 11, 42, in a paradox passage, he talks about the love of God was not being done or not being shown. So what are they doing? They're counting out all those leaves of mint. Could you imagine that? You pick up all these leaves, you count them, but you make sure the tenth goes to the Lord and you, the 90% you keep. How much time, effort, and energy would it take? If you count out herbs, it would take a lot. Jesus said, do that, but also be loving, be merciful, so justice. If you do that, you shouldn't leave these big things undone. Flip side, don't do the big things and forget the little things. See, when we focus on the minutia, the little pieces of being a follower of Jesus, and we neglect the big picture, that is a dead flock. You cannot do that. We don't have to pick and choose the parts of Christianity that we engage in. If we follow Jesus, we follow Jesus everywhere at all times. We get a care of from that. Last thing is that he had, and there's many, many more, is fear. Fear is a dead flock. When we turn over to Matthew chapter 10 and look at verse 27. Notice how Jesus tells, tells these, these disciples. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Tell everyone about what God has done. Notice. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, that word fear in our English is the same word. In the original, it's not the same word. The first fear, do not fear those who can kill the body, is dreadful fear. Don't be dreadfully afraid of those that can kill you. The second one is respect. So reverence to the one who can cast both soul and body in him. Respect, revere what he has to say. How many times do we swallow our Christianity because of our friend? Is a dead flock. So we start thinking about words like this. And we start thinking there's wisdom. Wisdom is putting the use of things that we know, it's not knowledge. Knowledge is the gaining of information, wisdom is how you use it. When we start thinking about the spiritual sins, we sit down and we think about what does God want me to do? There are people who wonder and worry all their life about this. But the preacher, Solomon, tells us at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Does he want me here or go there? I don't know. But if you follow God, you'll end up where you're supposed to be. You'll be there. Wisdom is living the way we know to live. Here in 65 and 100 days a year. Follow, knowing the way to go, and not do it. Not do it. That's follow. The truth is, People know how we live. We have professed to be Christians. 
have no doubt. Everybody is honest with their declaration and what they feel. But as we think about it, death lies in our lives that we think are really good, but when people see them in us, they recognize that we shouldn't live that way. And there are times we see it in ourselves when we know that we shouldn't live that way. And the reality is, we are. Wisdom says, throw the dead prize out. All he says is, have I can never have. So what is that? Are you wanting to be a wise? Or you want to be foolish? See, the thing about following God is you get to make that decision. Nobody just wants to make it for you. Nobody gets to make it for you. You make that decision. Today, if you've not yet put Christ on the baptism and have your sins forgiven, why not do it today? I know a guy. He became a Christian because he's sitting in a bar and he preached a plan of salvation and tell people how they weren't saved because they, didn't, they weren't living right. And they didn't follow the follow God's plan of salvation. They said, well, did you do that? No, I haven't done that. Then why are you preaching to us? Guess what he did? And I hear dead fly. He'll get rid of it. That's a true story. Today, if you do not follow Jesus, why not do it today? Why not do it today? If we can help you in any way, let that be me know. As we've seen this, the Lord protects us.